Go Big Red! Yeah! We must first, of course, thank the Artsies for hosting a great party for the gym of Cornell. <laughs> Uh, Dean Collins and Professor Strook and Beth Garrett, who we spend many long days and hours thinking about how we can together make Cornell the most wonderful place on the planet. And we believe that this gift is one of the first steps again to continue the tradition of excellence and diversity and expansion of mind and thought and people here on campus. So I do want to give a round of applause to Beth Garrett who's going on here. So it's great to be back here at Cornell. Um, you know, when you walk around campus, so many things inspire you and you have wonderful memories of the past and you know some things have not changed like the low rises still suck honestly. <laughs> but you go to West Campus and you see, that's actually a cool place now. <laughs> uh, but the thing that I think that, that struck me most uh, again today with the presentation is to see again, we have the most brilliant minds and inspired and authentic students and faculty and people on the planet right here. And it's exciting to be a part of that. It's exciting to be a part of the fabric that is the Cornell community. And as you dig down, into this community, you, you actually figure out that Cornell, while defined by a lot of traditions, we aren't confined by those traditions. And that's what makes us unique, and it makes us different. You know, next year, Roosevelt Island, we have expanded the boundaries of Ithaca to take who we are as a cultural and learned institution and actually bring forth some, frankly, some generous thought and ideas to the city of New York and create a place where those ideas can expand and grow. We even got Gates Hall, which is the most advanced computer sciences center right here on our campus, pretty far away from Silicon Valley. But the heart of innovation will now occur at Gates Hall. This is who we are. And so that's one of the best things I like about Cornell is we have the ability to expand our minds and engage with people from different backgrounds and different places. You know, I'm reminded, um, coming here, that people talked about Cornell as a place from people from New York. Well, when I got here, I met people from places like Bloomfield Hills, Michigan, and Houston, Texas, Macomb, Mississippi, some place you know, in the West Indies, which I had read about but never really met anyone from there, Shaker Heights, Ohio. <laughs> and some place they call Long Island. <laughs> <laughs> and befriended people who are first generation from Cuba. I mean, that's what Cornell is about, that diversity of background and thought that gathers on this campus to study and learn and to grow. That is the heart of who we are and our strength. And at this time, with political discourse, both here in America and throughout the world, there's an awful lot of talk about building walls. And Cornell is and must always be a place that tears them down. <laughs> and frankly, it's just as true as when I decided to call this campus my home. I grew up in Denver, Colorado, fourth generation native. And even as a young man, I had a, a sense of community. Certainly a part of that was being part of the African-American community and pursuing education and a career path that I knew would take me in places where I would be one of very few people like me for the rest of my life. So when I started visiting colleges during junior year and really trying to experience what it is to be at these campuses, and I got to visit just a few, mostly in state, but Cornell had a minority introduction to engineering program and they said, why don't you come and visit here? And I told my mother about this place called Cornell. And she said, oh, you're absolutely going to go check that out. Plus, they're playing for a plane ticket, $264. <laughs> and when I got here, it was a revelation. Ezra's promise. 
to found an institution where any person can find instruction in any study. Was this place blind to gender, to race, to class, to creed? Because most places that I visited at that time were not. And so back in my day, for you students, we used to have these things called books <laughs> that you'd find in a library. <laughs> and you'd do some research about the place that you were going to visit and potentially apply. And I did a little research on this place called Cornell and discovered that Cornell was committed to admitting women. And the first female students entered in 1870. The first African-American students were awarded bachelor degrees in 1890. The first in the country to award a PhD in mathematics to an African-American. His name was Albert Cox in 1925. The first to award a PhD to an African-American woman. Her name was Fleming Kittrell in 1936. And of course, the birthplace of the greatest fraternity <laughs> in the history of this country. One nine. But what I didn't know when I stepped foot on this campus that we actually, Cornell actually breathed life into those words and had a commitment to maintaining this culture of community and inclusion. I didn't find that in any other school when I visited. And so I knew that this was the place for me. And studying at Cornell turned out to be one of the best decisions of my life. I learned joy here. I learned, especially from where I was coming from, that joy came in different forms. The School of Chemical Engineering taught me the joy of understanding these physical systems that had an equilibrium all their own. And you would teach me skills and tools to decipher those systems and then manipulate those systems and find a new equilibrium. There was great joy in that. I learned that we chemical engineers, we have to appreciate other engineers and computer scientists. They do a really good job building tools for us <laughs> so that we can get on to the important business of solving problems. <laughs> I also learned that you could learn as much from Walt Whitman and Langston Hughes as you could from Heisenberg and Planck. Cornell gave me those things. I also learned that R&R &R meant rewrite and resubmit, <laughs> not rest and relaxation. <laughs> and during the intermissions, when I meet with some of my other friends and went to other Ivy League institutions, I found out we had this word here called rigor and hard work that didn't exist on those other campuses. And when they talked to us about the elements of style, there was a book we carried around, not a fashion show. <laughs> Some of you, I don't know if you still have strong and right elements of style. <laughs> the one thing I can tell you, that on this campus, at this place, it is still a meritocracy. President Rollins, I think about your words, one Cornell, the one Cornell initiative, and the shared governance is a perfect example of this. You know, you've spoken about working together, working together to take advantage of each other's strengths, collaborating in new ways and creating synergies that go beyond anything we've achieved in the past. To me, that's what diversity is. Ideas, thought, action, coming together, collaborating, and making it happen. And I'm pledging to you, I am here to help you do that. Many of you know the last part of my career, maybe not the last part, but the latest, is the world of investing. And we have a term for when you come up with an investment with extremely high upside and very little downside. It's called going all in. You put as much as you can in your resources and money into it. You put it on the line because you know that investment creates and represents an opportunity to meaningfully change the balance of your portfolio. And in philanthropy, you do the same thing. So let me tell you why I'm all in here at Cornell and this new center and what we're doing. We live in an extraordinary time. This is the first time in the history of the planet where wealth can be created not by having wealth before. 
before you had to have access to resources of land or water or people, and in some cases, assets of uh, financial assets. Today, there is a digitization of every single industry on the planet. And because of that, it is changing the entire economic equilibrium across the planet. And intellectual property has become the new currency of business. And all that is required to access that is the opportunity and trained minds. So the promise of brain power can move individuals and communities and families from poverty to prosperity in one generation. And it's within our grasp. The promise is not enough. We need to keep tearing down these walls. And right now, there's only one wall left to achieve this kind of economic mobility and equality. And that is the democratizing the access to world-class education. And the skills that are required to do that, you learn right here at Cornell. So you hear a lot of politicians talking about the kinds of jobs that we're losing. They should be talking about the kinds of jobs that we are creating. At this very moment, this rapid digitization, we call it the fourth industrial revolution. It's creating tremendous changes and in fact, at this moment, there's over 600,000 jobs available for people who are skilled in this area. In my own portfolio company of 43,000 employees, I have 500 open recs as I stand here today for people with your skills and your background. There is a disparity of opportunity. We see this expansion of the demand for these skills, but yet, what we find is there a disparity in the creation of people to fill those jobs. And this fourth industrial revolution is going to accelerate the demand for those jobs. And the imbalance, unfortunately, of that demand versus how many women and people in our communities in America are not trained and don't have these on-ramps is going to continue to expand unless we do something about it. To me, that's tremendously frustrating as an engineer. I see a system out of balance. I can't sleep at night. Well, not because of the babies, but <laughs> because the system is out of balance. And as you Cornell chemical engineers and biomolecular engineers know that if you have a system out of balance, you have to go and you have to fix it and do everything in your power to fix it. So that's why I am here, to provide energy and resources so that in this next generation, we can actually level this playing field and we can actually create security in our country and in this economy in ways that we've only dreamt about. And it's here and it's now. Often these generations, it takes generations for these industrial revolutions to actually play out to their own port of equilibrium. So now is our time. So look, I get the chance to now enjoy the company of very young engineers across my portfolio company. And I'll tell you, they're a little different than my generation, or at least my classmates' generation. They are more purpose-driven. They not only want to create a wonderful life for their families, but they also want to be part of something bigger. And that is a wonderful attribute of this generation. And frankly, for you students, that's why you are here. You're here to understand that the field you're entering in is where the action is and where the opportunity lies. You know, we always had this joke, and it's true. Chemical engineering is the modern day alchemy. We transfer one form of matter to another, and frankly, that opportunity to take that power, that knowledge, gives us promise to make changes in our society and profound changes that we can't imagine. So you will learn some tools and skills here that frankly will help you solve and create very elegant solutions to complex problems that only you uniquely can see because of your background, your training, and your skills. You're gonna create living systems, business systems, and industrial systems that are in concert and in harmony with the Earth and not in opposition to it. 
That's the fundamental change that you are now responsible for, and you're capable of doing it. And that's the way that you're going to harness your skills and technology to keep tearing down these walls that hold us back from being one as a community. So it's my privilege, in fact, it's my honor to be a part of this journey with you. And I know I'll do everything that I can to help you unlock the doors to make this a reality. And I've got great faith and confidence in you as students and in Cornell as an institution to make this happen. So I thank you for welcoming me and my family back to Cornell. behind us as we officially, as I now have the great honor of officially dedicating the Robert Frederick Smith School of Chemical and Biomolecular Engineering. 